Everybody, how are we doing? Happy Tuesday. My name's Anna Palmer. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Punchbowl News. Thank you so much for joining us in person and on the live stream for a pop-up conversation with Representative Kat Kamek, uh, presented by CTIA. We appreciate their partnership this year with a lot of conversations we've been having on 5G spectrum uh, and the like. And we're excited to get into those topics this morning uh, with the Republican from Florida. Afterward, Meredith Baker Atwell, the CEO and head of CTIA, is going to join me for a fireside chat. And we have a, a little bit of a special thing for those in the room. After those conversations, we are going to be doing a brown bag live. We have some colleagues uh, on our news team here, Heather Cagle, Andrew Desiderio, Max Cohen, who are going to be talking about 2024. We are one year out today. Uh, so we're going to talk about that as well as take some of the questions that have been presented to us uh, about what is on your minds around 2024. So appreciate you all joining us. As always, you can find Punchbowl News at Punchbowl News on all social media platforms. We encourage you to share this conversation. And with that, I'm going to re uh, welcome Representative Kamek to the stage. Good morning. Hey, thanks so much for doing this. I'm so grateful for short chairs. <laughs> Um, all right, well, we are going to start with some news of the day questions, as we always do, to kind of center the conversation. No shortage mm -hmm. of things happening or not happening here in Washington. Um, Want to start with government funding mm -hmm. and no. potential. <laughs> I'm shocking, right? No, I'm shocked. <laughs> government shutdown. What is Speaker Mike Johnson's plan for keeping the government funded? Uh, well, uh, currently it's, what, 9, 15-ish? Uh, so currently, GOP conference is happening. Obviously, I'm not there. <laughs> but there's a couple options that have been kicked around as to what the GOP could do to get a plan together in, say, 10 days. Um, we've been making steady progress on the appropriations bills. Um, I particularly enjoy getting in the chair and hustling through those amendments. But I have full confidence that, you know, we unlikely to have a CR this week, but next week, you know, it's crunch time. And there's something inherent about just Americans in general. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. We do our best work when the pressure is on. I mean, history has proved that time and time again. Doesn't matter what subject, but we always do our best work when uh, when the heat gets turned up on us. So we'll see. As a journalist, I understand a deadline. I have a hard time doing the work before. Uh, Congress right. does not. Right. Um, let's talk about one other big issue here, which is aid for Israel and Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, it's been an outstanding issue. The House tried its own kind of uh, tactic with taking a separate Israel package that is not going to go anywhere. What chances do you give a relief package that's going to have both Israel and Ukraine funding happening before the end of the year? The, the challenge, of course, is not the policy, it's the politics. I mean, that, that is really what is driving so much of what we're seeing on the Hill. And so within the conference, there is a growing concern about a lack of a mission, a lack of accountability, a lack of transparency when it comes to the funding for Ukraine. Uh, I know in the, in the coming weeks, the White House is going to be trying to do some outreach uh, to talk about mission, to talk about uh, strategy. And, and I would say even more broadly, there is a concern about a lack of strategy, transparency, and accountability on all issues. There is that frustration. We've seen that, heck, in the speaker's fight. Um, a lot of those issues, those core fractures, were bleeding out into the conversation. So it's, it's bigger than just Ukraine and, and Israel funding. I think overwhelmingly, of course, as we saw last week with the package, uh, House Republicans and Democrats are ready and willing to go to bat for Israel. Right. Ukraine, a little bit different of a situation. I think you could probably find some mods in the middle on the Republican side, but likely in a package like that to lose 100 plus Republicans is my sense. Um, and I like to think I have a pretty good sense of the conference, but I don't think that that is going to be as clean as people think. I, I think marrying the two, there's going to be all kinds of little additions added to a package like that. Because there's also been talk about Taiwan. And, right, right. Yeah. And border, potentially, as well. Yes. Um, I want to welcome people to come. There's a couple seats up here in front. I know there's a lot of people standing in the back, so um, I appreciate if you want to come in. Feel free to do that. I want to make sure everyone's comfortable. Um, switching gears, I yeah. want to talk... As I mentioned at the top, we are one year to the day uh, for the 2024 cycle. You are recruitment chair. We're talking backstage uh, <laughs> okay. about the efforts that you have been doing to recruit. Yeah. Talk about 
one or two, or you know, if you have a couple of candidates that should be on everybody's radar that maybe isn't? Ooh, okay. So I, I am very excited about our candidates. Um, as we were talking, you know, I think there's a phenomenal slate of candidates. We have 37 that are very, very good primary focus, and then about 42 that. Uh, when we round it out, that's really the, the the scale of what we're working with. I think Minnesota too, uh, Joe T. Rab, incredible candidate, incredible life story. Uh, like I told you, I think he he kind of reminds you of a a, a real life GI Joe. Um, it, he's a phenomenal candidate. We have a NASCAR driver, Austin, out of Maine, uh, in places that you wouldn't expect. Oregon, Washington, some really really great candidates. Virginia has become a hotbed um, for. Um, really, really strong, aggressive candidates. And so I, I feel very encouraged. The, the drama that has played out up here in Washington would, at first blush, people would say, oh my gosh, I don't want to do this. But that has really been the driving message of, this is why we need to grow the majority in the House. This is why we need more candidates, good, strong candidates to run. Because when you have four members as your, as your majority, that's a very scary time. And then it becomes like the House is its own little mini Senate. You know, Every member then can effectively change the dynamics in the course of, of, of history by their personal agenda, as we've seen. So I think that growing the majority is number one priority, of course, keeping and growing the majority. And we have the slate of candidates that I think can do that. All right, last question on politics, and then we'll get to 5G spectrum and what we are really here to talk about this morning. Uh, but you're one of the rare House Republicans who has not endorsed in the presidential election yet. Why? Maybe I'm just a contrarian. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, I, I think that um, we have a lot of phenomenal candidates running uh, for president. The, the bench of talent within the GOP um, for president is incredible. And every single one of them brings a unique skill set. That being said, I am a Floridian. And there are two Floridians in this race. And obviously, that complicates a little bit for me. But I also think that um, an endorsement is more than just your name. For me, when I go all in for someone, I will literally run through a brick wall for you. And for that, I want to be more than just a name on a list. Um, and I want to be a value add. And so there's a lot of things that can happen between now and Iowa. And uh, as someone who spends a lot of time in early states, like Iowa, New Hampshire, in fact, um, I was up in New Hampshire speaking as a lone congressional representative for the First in the Nation Summit. And uh, they affectionately call me their adopted congresswoman. I'll take it. It's a, it's a big, it's a big <laughs> delegation, too. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, we were talking, and, and you hear from people on the ground, and they say, and this is coming from people who, in early states, you really have to earn their vote. Mm. I mean, presidential candidates are in their living room talking to all of you know six people. It is really, really the grassroots. You know, I'm going to earn every single vote in these early states type of dynamic. And in talking with people in Iowa, in New Hampshire, they want to see someone who isn't just going to do well in a primary. They want someone who's going to obviously win in the general, which is a real concern in this hyper polarized uh, dynamic that we're living in, but have a plan, have a vision. I think that is something that Americans in general are hungry for, is a vision for our country. Because we are literally living in what I call the angertainment era of politics. It's, I'm going to stomp my feet, I'm going to tweet in all caps, and that has somehow turned into the definition of fighting. It's not. I mean, we all in this room know that, but we want... We collectively, as Americans, we want to see someone who is going to actually have a strategy to win and move the needle in a positive way for the country. And um, so I've got a little bit of time. I'm still having conversations with, with all of the candidates. I'm proud to say I'm friends with all of them, and they're great people. Uh, but we'll see what comes in the next few months. Feel free to tell Punchable News first uh, when you uh, make that decision. Uh, no, I'll make that uh. plug here. Uh, all right, let's talk Spectrum and 5G. Yes. You remember the House Energy and Commerce Committee that has jurisdiction over these issues. Things have been pretty stalled when it comes to FCC authority to auction Spectrum that was set to expire in December, extended until March. It hasn't made much progress. What, what's happening? Tell us. Bring us into the, the, what the conversations you're having. Oh, well, like any good House member, I'm going to blame the Senate. <laughs> um, 
No, I mean, think about this. We had a really great package um, when it came to spectrum reauthorization and some reforms that would be really necessary, you know, including fully funding the rip and replace, which is so critical, which I hope we get a chance to talk about um, getting rid of the, the Chinese technology in our telecommunication system. But, you know, we had that bill. It passed out of committee. Then we had an extension, and some personalities in the Senate decided no. They wanted to have it their way. And I think it was in large part because um, there are some people in the Senate uh, that believe that spectrum authority should be vested within DOD. And at risk of sounding like a coexist bumper sticker on the back of a Prius, <laughs> spectrum authority can peacefully coexist with DOD and commerce. You know, they, they, they are hand in glove. You need a strong, robust economy for national security, just like you need your traditional defense. And so I think really talking about commercial uses as a, uh, in the, the lens of a national security mm -hmm. uh, conversation is important. So that, of course, authority expired. Now we are in limbo. And the thing that's really frustrating is we have those licenses that have yet to be issued, and that's $20 billion, give or take. That's $20 billion um, that is being held up. So. It's a bit frustrating. We're waiting on a report from a DOD that was supposed to be due in August. It's you November. Know, <laughs> it's, it's November. And for a blonde, even I know that that is late. <laughs> um, but that's where things currently stand. So we're looking for opportunities and, and really building out a strategy of how can we advance um, the auction authority to get it back online. Um, I think that, that is, that's that's important. Are you hopeful before the end of the year? Or are we just looking at the first quarter of next year, realistically, given the fact that the UD hasn't even produced the report at this point? Well, we know that the report is is completed. So that's that's encouraging. Uh, getting our hands on that report could be a little bit more difficult. So um, I have to be optimistic. I'm in Congress. Otherwise, <laughs> that would be a very sad existence if I was not optimistic. Uh, but I think by the end of the year, and, and a lot of this is education, because let's be honest, I mean, us in this room, we understand spectrum, we understand 5G policy. When you talk to your average Joe on the street, and I use my husband as an example, he's a firefighter, SWAT medic, really intelligent guy, but his day-to-day -day is literally saving people's lives. He's a great sounding board. And when I told him I was doing this, he said, all right, break it down for me, and I explained it to him. He's like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> so not exactly the most sexy topic that we could be discussing. So, you know, when you're doing a hit on Fox or CNN or MSNBC, it's not top of mind. It's not something that is going to get voters fired up. But it is such an integral part of our economy, of our everyday life, the Internet of Things. People don't understand that. And so it's our job to be strategic in a way that allows us to move this issue forward but is it going to be front page of paper? No. Right. But having those conversations with our colleagues, I think that's where having relationships on the Hill are going to be really important and working across the aisle in a bicameral, bipartisan way. So let's drill, drill down on that, the idea that I, I think that's really right, right? I mean, it, there's not a lot of people maybe in America who are thinking about this every single day and, and what it means to them. But you represent a state that has rural America as part mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. the need for broadband. Can you talk about that? Not just farming, but this is healthcare, this is education. I mean, this is kind of cross-disciplinary at this point. Oh, yeah. I mean, so obviously the spectrum authority is the backbone of the 5G deployment across the United States. And so when you're, you're talking about 5G, this is the equivalent of the electrification of America in the 1930s, right? It's delivering high-speed, reliable, affordable connectivity. And now we know we have 5G broadband, um, but that connectivity is critical across the map in order to compete in anything, whether it is healthcare, whether it is education, whether it is commerce. Uh, you mentioned agriculture, precision agriculture. You're not going to be running fiber to all, el you know, every nook and cranny of the United States. And the technology within agriculture, I'm just going to use that because I also sit on ag, it is getting so good. I mean, right now we're rolling out sea and spray technology that has an AI backbone to it, right? And, and it is real time pinging off of sensors of what it is seeing on the ground, but also feeding um, information that is coming from satellites. I mean, this is a way that we can produce more with less in a extremely, I would say, overregulated environment that is squeezing our producers to the point of no return. 
you have a real need for this connectivity to compete, yes, but also to survive. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk to people, like in my district, for example, this is something that they, there are people in my district still on dial-up. Like, I, and I, it's crazy to me that there are people that have been born now that, like, they, they don't know what dial-up is. <laughs> and as the baby in Congress, that kind of hurts my soul. <laughs> but you think about, they, they have no concept of what it was like when we were in an analog type of, of setup. And so if we're going to compete with, say, China, if we're going to compete on a global scale, we have to be connected. And that spectrum authority on the back end is really the, the, the way that we do this in a way that gets us in every nook and cranny, but also sets us up for 6G. Which is even, that's the future, right? We were trying to get the spectrum just for 5G at this point. <laughs> um, Baby steps. Yes. Let's talk, we're gonna quickly run out of time here, but I do wanna talk about China. You mentioned at the top, and that has been one of the kind of the central themes. Can you do it like Donald Trump? <laughs> I don't, maybe you should, you can. China. <laughs> I definitely can't, but I appreciate that you did. <laughs> I love I love the way he says it. And uh, I've told him that too. I'm gonna work on that. I'm gonna work on that <laughs> next time. Um, but I wanna talk about uh, China, the US leadership on 5G, yeah. what you're seeing um, as it relates to cybersecurity, as it relates to these issues and why it's so important. Yeah, I mean, let, let's just all you know, be honest, China doesn't play by the rules. Uh, it's it's kind of like uh, China operates with a perpetual yellow light. It's a suggestion, you know. They don't stop. It's not anything other than oh, we like to see what other people are doing, but we're going to do our own thing. And when we're talking about, and I'll just go back to rip and replace for example, the telecommunication technology that is you know ZTE, Huawei, um, that was used uh, to build out so much of our system. It really is a national security threat. Um, there, there have been confirmations of backdoor access that they can use to access Americans' data. Um, and then, of course, when you have someone, a foreign adversary, who could control your entire network, I mean, that is command and control. When I was at the Naval War College, that was the very first thing beyond war termination that you learn about is command and control. And so when they can potentially take down your communications, that is a massive threat, not to mention that we have over 750 military installations overseas that are riddled with this telecommunication technology. Um, one of the things that we put into the bill, uh, the, the, the Spectrum bill, was a pay for, for rip and replace, which there's a $3 billion shortfall. That is something that we have got to address because not only are we seeing that in our military installations overseas, but here, you look at places like Wyoming and the Dakotas, mm -hmm. which I believe you're from the Dakotas. I am. Do you, and you don't have the O's. Well, you know, maybe not this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so my family's from Minnesota. Maybe at night. Okay, you know? okay, okay. <laughs> get a little tired. <laughs> maybe get a drink or something. Exactly. And then she's going to be like, oh, don't you know, we're going to stay for supper. Yeah. My yeah. family's from Minnesota. I can say that. I, I'm not offended. It's good. We're good. She's from Fargo. I'm just kindred, actually. Really? Yes. Kindness okay. is the way of life. That's the motto. Did you grow up with Ludafisk? Of course. <laughs> Left this, is, yeah, this, this is really is, taking a side. This is really going sideways. Sorry. But anyways, back to China. Back to China. China. Um, <laughs> well, I'm never coming back. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> they're like, we're never bringing her back. No, it is. It's so critical for our national security. And, and again, I mean, like I said, Getting this done is important for that element of rip and replace, which I was overseas recently um, with uh, actually the Indian uh, government and was talking to them about their, their challenges with this type of communication issue and technology. And their strategy was, we're gonna let it age out. Like that was, it wasn't rip and replace, it was, it's so, it is literally so embedded in everything, we're gonna just let it age out. Hmm don't necessarily agree with that strategy, but I mean, everyone is trying to contend with this issue. And then beyond that, you think about things like, particularly close to my heart, next generation 911. Um, my husband's a first responder in a rural district. I can't tell you how many times, particularly as a SWAT medic, they'll be on a super scary call out going on 16, 17 hours in a very rural part of, of the district and their radios don't work. They, their cell phones don't work. And a lot of our first responders are, particularly on the LEO side, 
they don't have partners anymore, right? It's, they're out there on their own. They go into a Walmart and they have no signal. There's real concerns about delivering first responder services and first responder technologies into some of these areas because there is that expectation, no matter where you go in the country, that if you pick up the, if you dial 911, someone's going to be there, they're going to be there quick, and it's going to be a professional response. So that's one of the elements. And then beyond that, I would say, because I know we're coming up on the end, um, permitting reform. Um, I think that this is something that is a very easy thing that we can advance in a bipartisan, bicameral way. We still are operating off of paper applications. We have made steps. In fact, our office authored legislation that was passed to digitize this process, to really streamline it, make it more user friendly. And I think that these are just very simple, common sense things that we can be doing that will get us into a better position to better compete, but also to improve our national security. All right, we're going to leave it there. Representative Hammock, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank right. you Have so a good much. Day. Thank Here. you. Thank you, guys. All right, now I'd like to welcome Meredith Atwell Baker, CEO and head of CTA, to join me for a fireside chat. Meredith. Well, I'm really good to see you. That was a great job. Yes. She makes it easy. A great conversation. Yes. Um, well, we're going to pick up where we just left off. Um, Want to talk, last time we were on stage, you were about to go to the show, um, and which is the big kind of uh, meeting of the minds of the industry. Wanted to get you know, your feedback, what you heard, trends of what people are thinking when it comes to 5G spectrum in the industry. Well, I love it when our industry gets together because it really invigorates you. You see all the innovation that's happening out there. You see what people are doing with this, this build that's come 50% faster than the 4G build out. Um, we have a long way to go still. We're still the beginning of the 5G era, but I just get so excited about seeing some of these companies that are on the floor of the show. Um, actually, even just right up the street is one I just this week found out about that I think is really interesting. It's Gallaudet University, and they've got 5G in their helmets, so they're hard of hearing, and their deaf uh, players can actually get play calls. So it's literally changing the playing field. I mean, 5G is such a game changer. I think sometimes we forget because we get so, and it's very important, the auction authority conversation that we're going to get to and probably ACP and several other topics, very important. But what are, what are these networks doing? They're 100 times faster. There's going to be 100 times more data attached to them. And they're five times more responsive. So the play calling from the sidelines, I mean, it's, it's immediate. It means autonomous cars, immediate. Remote surgery, there's so much that's coming that's exciting. And when you go to the show and you see the interest, the industry luminaries and all the new entrepreneurs, it really is, it, it, it makes you excited. We were just hearing from Representative Kamek too, some of the real life implications, right? Mm -hmm. About her husband being a 911 responder, those types of things that, that the technology really is enabling in a way that from rural North Dakota, that wasn't, I mean, I've had dial up, you know? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't what it is today. Talk about Spectrum Authority, how it lapsed, it was extended till March. Uh, where do things stand from your perspective? See, I want to start with a positive story. <laughs> <laughs> because Sorry, here, we are, here we are. I mean, it just, it's incredible to me that we have been the world's leader in Spectrum and we have been the world's leader in building out these networks and, and we're just stymied. You and I are having a Groundhog Day conversation, which is, it was fascinating to me that we ever let auction authority lapse. Right. And the fact that we haven't been able to get it reauthorized is, is crazy. So the FCC is literally not able to do their job on Spectrum. Meanwhile, I think you and I have also talked about what we really need from this administration, which is a bold national strategy for Spectrum. And um, we are waiting for the report from DOD, which, you know, um, I, I have worked in these jobs. They're hard. Um, Spectrum is a difficult conversation, but there can be a win-win. So I'm really hopeful that we can move past a point where we're waiting on a report to where we can get around a table and, and figure out how, how do we do what we did with AWS3 mm -hmm. when um, you know the Naval got money to upgrade their systems and we got the Spectrum for 5G that we're rolling out right now. Um, so we're stuck there. We're stuck stuck um, with the National Spectrum Plan, which I really, really, really hope is bold. They have smart people working on it, but it needs to be a bold pipeline plan for the next decade. So I'm, I'm hopeful because I too am positive, um, but it, we are really, I mean, Anna, this summer China snapped its fingers 
and gave 700 megahertz to, of spectrum to, for their development. That's more than we've done in a decade. We are losing ground globally. I'm going to Dubai for Thanksgiving for the World Radio Communications Conference because everybody wants to go to Thanksgiving <laughs> in Dubai. Um, but we don't have a United States position. We are really losing our global advantage and um, it's, um, we really have to, we have, I'm looking to the administration, I'm looking to Congress. We've got to enable our entrepreneurs to continue to lead the world. So talk about, we, we would talk about the Biden administration, kind of what they're trying to do, this national plan, you want it to be bold. Is there one or two things you're hopeful or that you've put forward to say like, this really does need to be part of the package? We know which bands we want, um, and they know which bands we want. Um, and, you know, the government right now has 12 times more spectrum than industry does. So there should be a little bit better of a balance there. Um, we want the bands that are harmonized globally. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to make the chips work in phones everywhere. That's what's going to make it less expensive, and that would, it would be what would help us not be an island. <laughs> we would be part of the global system. So. Um, we know what we're asking them for. Um, I think we're going to move forward to studying those bands, mm -hmm. and I'm hopeful we can all um, figure it out. I think when we were here last, it was Representative Fluger, yeah. and I loved the way he said this. He said, um, national security is critically important. We all agree on that. But they don't need all the spectrum all the time everywhere. Yeah. So there's a, way, there's a way to get to where we need to go so that we can – continue to be leading the world in um, you know, wireless and innovation. Let's talk about that, because I think one of the things, you know, you're obviously steeped in this industry, there's a lot of people that are, but some, some of us aren't necessarily doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. So you go from 4G, kind of dial up to 5G, you we're still expanding that. The Congresswoman was just talking about 6G. I mean, what kind of project forward? Like how, where, where is this going in terms of technology and, and what maybe some of us aren't, you know, kind of in, in the, the future forward looking part of this? It's a great question. Um, and I think we don't exactly know where we're headed. We're just really excited about it. Um, when forward, well, you know, th every G is a different decade and we see in innovation with every G. Let's just take 4G because that really changed our lives. That developed the sharing economy. And all of those companies are based in the United States because we got our spectrum right. Um, but when we invented it, I think we thought it was going to uh, you were going to disconnect your computer from being plugged in. It was going to be a dongle. But then innovators created this incredible sharing economy, and it's changed our lives. So we know what 5G can do. We can think of some of the apps, and we see companies like Beep in Atlanta that's developing um, buses that are autonomous, that are taking cars off the road and helping our climate. I mean, we can, we can think about what is coming, but we don't quite know. We're still in the very early. Every G is about 10 years. And so we're still in the early part of the 5G decade. Um, certainly in our standards bodies and globally, we're looking at what do we want to happen in 6G. But we're still, um, we're still very much excited about where 5G is going. All right, we're going to run out of time quickly, but China has been a theme in this conversation and kind of throughout the year in the U.S. leadership and how important it is. Um, What's your message when you go to Dubai or to around the world and talking to leaders or to as your executives are trying to kind of figure out the future that the role you want the U.S. to play? Um, the U.S. is all of the innovators that are here. We have the capital markets that are here. We just need to make sure that we have a bold national spectrum plan so that we will enable those folks to do what they do best because they're the best in the world. I don't think there's any better to leave it. All right. Thank you so much, Meredith. Okay. Appreciate it.